um, and we're chatting a, we're chatting a few um, months back, and after Conga, Tobiwa went to work for McKinsey, and he's now working as a principal engineer. Actually, is he a principal engineer, a soft staff engineer at Meta, right? Or Facebook or Meta, as we call it. And um, we're just talking about career and progression and some of the challenges you face, some of the cultural differences you, and we got talking about this. So my conversation with Tomiwa has led to this. Um, so I'm not going to claim 100% responsibility for the slides, but what I've done is I've taken Tomiwa's conversations and I've just expressed my own views. So on Slack earlier, I think I wrote, I got 23 years experience. So I was a bit optimistic, it's 22 and a bit. Um, so I'm sure there are people here who are 21 years old, so I've been working before you were born. Now I feel very old, um, which is also something. So I'm quite excited to be here. I've invited Nifemi as well to join me. I'm gonna be asking her a few questions. She recently started a job. And because she had just started her job, she's a good case study. I like, I like making things practical. But before we get into this, let me actually try to bring up the survey. Okay, let me go through the questions first. Then we will talk about the survey. So quick, true or false questions. Some of them might sound a bit tricky. Um, hard work alone will get me to the top of my career. So you can answer true or false. You can't do maybe. You have to choose one. Um, harvest is the time when I relax to enjoy the fruit of my labor. Again, you can say true or false. Um, this is probably not directly related to career, but in a way it is. Workplace politics is, uh, sorry, my typo. Uh, actually, one of the things I talked about addresses this, so I make my own mistakes as well. Shows nothing is perfect. Workplace politics is bad. As long as my manager is happy with my work, I will get promoted. No other person's opinion matters. And then I think the final one is to make progress in my career, I need to learn how to talk up to the boss. So let me take a break from this. Has everyone attempted the quiz and let me yes okay let me i'll stop sharing for a bit because i don't want you to see all my all the paraphernalia of my stop share on my screen and then i will bring out the results and then let's let's see what the distribution of the answers look like uh, okay, response is 18. Share my screen again. Ah, I feel like I think you need to give me the right again. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me host again or something. So does I vote? Or maybe I should just claim the host. Okay, I'm the host, okay. Right, so let me try again. Share. Um, okay. The results. So 24 people responded. Hard work alone will get me to the top of my career. So most people said false. Um, harvest is the time when I can relax and enjoy the fruit of my labor. Most people think true is the answer. Workplace politics is bad. About two thirds of the people think workplace politics is bad. As long as my manager is happy with my work, I'll get promoted No other person's opinion matters. Most people think the answer is false. And to make progress in my career, I need to learn how to suck up to the boss. Most people also think it's false. So, um, Okay, this is good. Let's go through the slides and then we'll try to answer some of these questions to the best of my ability and my experience. Again, bear in mind, this is my experience. So I'm not necessarily saying it's gospel, but it's my experience. And I think the 20 something years I've been working is worth something. Okay, so power tools for career success. Why I had to come up with a framework. So I was speaking to Nifemi last week, Saturday, and she's just hired this job. So she was asking me a few questions. I had a short version of this. I was talking to her and over the weekend, and I think early on Monday, it became a bit bigger. So I'll go through the tools first. So PAR is an acronym. Again, 
this is something I've learned. If you want to convey a message, find something that helps people to understand it. So power is just a nice one. So the last talk I gave, I think I said ABCDE squared. So if you want to remember, it, you know, mnemonics, people remember things like this. So power, so what's power? So P is for prepare, O is for observe, W. Yeah, you know, words, but really I meant communication here. So E is for execute, R is for retrospecting. Now, this is, I think this is useful whether you are already working somewhere. I think it is fantastic if you are just starting a new job. For, for many of you who are still looking for work, just make a note of this. It, it, it will, it's also useful for you, but some of the information will be better, will be more applicable when you do start working. But it's good to start thinking about these things even as you prepare, as you go through coding courses and all that. So we'll go through five sort of tools like the finger. Um, P for preparation, two for observation, three for work, for communication, four for execution, and R for reflection, right? So let's go through. So preparation. Now, the question I asked about harvest, and I think most people said, yeah, harvest is for relaxing. So something struck me a while back. My daughter is writing uh, secondary school exams. So I was trying to encourage her, I said, you know what? So again, for me, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I was sharing the Bible with her. I said, hey, um, seed time and harvest time, you know, the Bible says in, Gen in Genesis that it will always be. In my head, I'd always thought harvest was the time where you chill and relax. But then it occurred to me, actually, harvest is a very busy time for farmers. If anyone here comes from a farming background, I don't think harvest is the time where you relax, really. Harvest is the time when you work. So the way to the um, analogy here is when you're preparing for the interview, and I've seen this, um, I'll, I'll say, well, in my opinion, it's a mistake, but some people would argue, and I've made the mistake myself. When you get a job, people think getting a job is the end in itself. So this has happened to me in the past. So I was really working hard to get into project management at the time. And I, I you know, I'd, I used to work for MTN in Nigeria. I went through all the studying, all the certifications. I've done projects for MTN in Nigeria and I used that. And I got certified as a PMI project manager in 2005. At the time, not many people even in Nigeria were at the PMP certification. So I was all excited. So I got to the UK, I started looking for work. Eventually I found my project manager job. The day I got that job, I thought that was my harvest. It was time to relax. Then as, what I mean is I started looking for the next thing. What is the next thing I would do? So I thought, oh, this thing called Six Sigma is interesting. Let me look into it. And from a lot of Africans, which is why a lot of Africans, we like studying. We like pieces of paper. We like certifications. Not a bad thing, but honestly, not a fantastic thing either, right? When you get that job, what I learned eventually was because I started looking at another certification, I took my eyes off the ball. I was no longer like really, really focused on learning the job. And I'll show you some of the tools that will actually get you to learn the job. So learning the job after getting, getting the job is just like the, a door has been opened onto you. You come in. It's not time to think, oh yeah, now I got the job. A few people have spoken to me <laughs> and they said, oh, I just got a job. Now I'm thinking of the next thing. And one of them told me, can you be my reference? I want to write an, I want to do an MBA. And I said, but why? You've just gotten a job for heaven's sake. You need to establish yourself on the job first, establish your credibility, then you can go try to get an MBA. So, and I've seen quite a few people have, have, have said this. So preparation, and I'll give you just a few, a few tools here, a few tips. So the first thing is when you get a job, you need to establish your, your subject matter expertise. Um, you need to know the company and you need to know the team. And then you need to also pitch yourself. So many of us don't see ourselves as a brand and we all make this mistake. Sometimes I, I also don't, right? So many people have mastered it. There are people who may not be as good as you in certain things, uh, but when, when they talk on, uh, 
on, on, on social media, you think they're the best. There was a gentleman, I don't know, remember the person's name now. When they got on Dufuna, they started talking about their Dufuna journey. And, and I, was, I kept wondering how long would this thing last? Because for heaven's sake, talking about Dufuna journey on Twitter is not as important as getting yourself and coding. And maybe that was their approach to putting themselves on that pressure to get on the job. But after about two or three weeks, I stopped seeing all the <laughs> all the Twitter posts because learning how to code is difficult um, and all that. So I'll, I'll touch on this one by one. Again, I'm trying to boil 22 years of work into a, about an hour. If I don't finish it today, I'll continue some other time. So no rush. I think it's better to do it justice than to try to um, rush it through. So, okay, I'll, I'll call NFM in a bit, but before then, let's talk about company knowledge. So now you've just gotten a job. Instead of you thinking, oh, by the way, let me go and do my, my master's or something or get another certification. Many times that certification will not necessarily add to your value in the company. But if you want your peers, your managers and your stakeholders in the company to take you seriously, you need to know three things. You need to know as much about that company as possible. Imagine you're an engineer and you meet the CEO of your company. Let's assume it's a startup or even like a senior manager at a party. And you guys start talking and you start talking about all your competitors. You start talking about market share. You start talking about the kind of customers, the difference between and so let me go way back Assuming at the time I knew I, I could differentiate between an MTN customer and a, at the time there was, there was Econet, <laughs> there was an Econet customer. If I could say all that and I met a manager, what I want someone who can, again, I can't see the screen. So anyone, any first person to just be able to unmute. What do you think that manager will have in mind about me? And I'm, I'm just a software developer, junior software developer in, uh, in MTM. But I know all these facts. I can talk about the company. I can talk about the market. I can talk about growth. What do you think they will think? What do you, what do you think their perception of me would, look, would be like? This guy is passionate about the job. OK, so thank you. Passion, anything else? Um, you understand the business. You understand how you make money. We understand how we make money. Any anyone else? Any other thoughts? You have their best interests. Yeah. If they have an a project, a cross-functional project where they need someone who's technical, do you think they would like to involve me or not? Sure, they would. Yeah. And how how do you think that's going to affect my my personal growth? within the company. You get good reviews at the end of the month or quarter. Yeah, and when there's promotion, who are they likely to, if, if, if they were discussing promotion and that person was in the room while they are discussing promotion and there are two of us to be put forward and both of us can code run about the same, but there's only space for one person. Who would make it? Yeah. That's it. So sometimes this is the difference between getting a job and getting promoted on the job because someone else is showing initiative, someone else is learning about going beyond their job title, which is I'm just a software developer, I'm just a switch engineer, or I'm just a network engineer, I'm just a product manager to show, take initiative and learn a lot more about the market. So that's um, company. And then this model is called the three C's analysis by some Japanese dude called Kenichi Homei. Sounds like an African name, right? Sounds like someone from Imo State in Nigeria. Right. So that's that's one. You always prepare yourself to, you know, look at how your role, how your job contributes to the ultimate success of the company. And also this makes you relevant within that industry over time. So that's that. Next one is subject matter expertise. Well, many of us are good at this. So if you're coding, people quickly, you find the right blogs, what are the authorities in the field, like a good sort of um, practice is you wake up in the morning, you get to work in the morning, 
you know, the mistake I used to make, uh, you know, I was working in the UK. I, I, I'm a news, I, 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 for some silly reason, I like to be on top of the news. So I used to waste a lot of my time reading the news, right? It's good to do it, but, you know, everything is about balance. But a serious, someone who's really serious about their career, what they should do is there should be a, an industry blog where you start your day in the morning. And that industry block will be talking about the latest in design, latest product management practices. They could be analyzing a product. They could be doing something, something that adds knowledge to you without you necessarily thinking too much about it. This is really important. And you should develop this habit very early on before you even take on a new job or get into a new industry. Start reading about it, start learning about it. And then new coding frameworks you need to work on, domain knowledge. So if you're, for example, you're going into banking or going into payments, what are the payment standards? Uh, PCI, DSS, whatever it is, you know, although you are just an engineer, can you read that manual and know it like the back of your hands? What's the regulation? What are the issues? It's not too much. This is what makes the difference sometimes between someone who, um, between a rock star and a, a regular guy. So again, going back to my experience and some of the mistakes I know, like when I speak to my own peers, and even now when I speak to people, many people will tell you that to become the CEO of a company or to move up, you need a master's degree, you need a PhD degree. Yeah, yes, sometimes, and I have a master's degree, so I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But what you'll find is you go to some organizations and really, those people end their masters on the job. They didn't sit in a formal educational structure to acquire that master's degree. They learned it through things like this. They have a bachelor's of science or a bachelor's of arts, but they know the industry inside out. They know the regulation. They have that domain knowledge. Ask them, wake them up and ask them anything about the standards in the industry, they know it. Those things are never taught in school. And when you have to consider between that kind of knowledge and a formal structured um, postgraduate knowledge, that, inform that knowledge acquired informally on, on the job about the industry, a specific industry, always trumps the formal knowledge. That doesn't mean that you, should, you shouldn't go for the formal knowledge as well, but just know its place. That's why sometimes you find um, Africans, especially when you go to the West, you find Africans with multiple master's degrees and PhD, but they are still not necessarily moving up, right? So that's subject matter expertise. Wow, I don't have a lot of time today. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna invite Nifem to speak for a second. So Nifem just started a job and I was asking her, when you started that job, how did you introduce yourself? So Nifemi, do you wanna do that for, for, for us? Just tell us some of the, uh, so she's found a job in, uh, okay, maybe just talk about yourself a bit, where you're working okay. now and, and your experience introducing yourself. Okay, uh, I feel like I have been put on the spot. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. Um, so some context about my myself. So I actually uh, used to work with uh, Tox at Kota and Kushan at Dufuna actually. So I know some some names and it's possible some people can remember my my name. So I recently moved to, to Berlin actually, um, that's in Germany. And uh, I have now started a a new job as a product manager here um, with a company called Spryker in Berlin. And um, what the company does is the, the company builds um, tech for big companies in the e-commerce sector. So uh, think of something like Magento um, or like a Salesforce, right? So that's what we do. Okay, now to answer Tox's question, um, I mean, how did I introduce myself? Uh, on the first day I, because it's changing um, now that I am learning um, learning ways to better introduce myself and I also had this interesting conversation with Tux. Um, so I remember on the first day uh, when we were told to introduce ourselves of course um, there was a format which really helped um, but the part where I really didn't prepare for was a fun fact so after telling them about yourself and answering those questions there's a part where you you're required to say something interesting about yourself like a fun fact and um, I, I actually wasn't prepared 
for that. And um, um, I, what did I even say? I think I said something about. Uh, I I don't think I want to mention what I said actually because it wasn't actually fun. And um, I mean, I started thinking about it um, after the day, and I'm like, I have to do better. So I, how do I introduce myself now? So now, what I do is, of course, I tell people my name, and I tell. Some people already know my name. If you already know my name, I skip that part. And then I tell you where I am from. So I tell you that I'm from Nigeria, from the southwestern part of Nigeria, right? And then for some people that are interested in, some people interrupt sometimes. Oh, um, what tribe? I tell them I'm, I'm Yoruba, right? I'm from the Yoruba tribe. And then um, what I do after telling them about where I'm from is, of course, I tell them um, when I moved to to Berlin, why I moved to Berlin. And then after doing that, then I tell them a little bit about uh, my my story. That's my career journey, right? Uh, what I've done in the past and um, why I am here now. And uh, yeah, what I'm looking to achieve, what I really love, right? Um, so that answers the question about what's unique about me. And um, right, and the last thing I do now is... Um, I mean, I tell you something, I, I try to look for something interesting. So the interesting facts um, that I now have in my, in my head is, of course, I, I'm immune to spoilers, like movie spoilers and any random thing that, that comes yeah, during the introduction. So I am actually still learning how to better introduce myself. So looks, I don't know if I answered. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. Thank you. And I think this thing is about practice, but the, like, the question is, why do you even need this? Why can't you just say my name is um, Kola Ogufaoka and leave it there? Because you want to be memorable, right? I worked with a bunch of uh, folks. So when I, I used to work in a, in a really big tech company and we, got, we had to go to Dublin for our induction. So when I got there, I met, so what the company also did was they hired lots of young people, fresh graduates from across Europe, Middle East and Africa, and they brought all of them to Dublin for induction. So while talking to some of them, I realized how challenging it was to stand out, right? You could have in one batch, maybe hundred or 200 people start. So pick any of these tech companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, as an example. And you are coming from Nigeria, maybe you went to Ladoke Akitola University. And in your head, because on the list of universities in the world, Ladoke Akitola University is not highly rated, or you went to the University of Lusaka. So you may, there's a chance that you feel, you feel really intimidate, intimidated. But the thing you need to start telling yourself is, the reason you probably didn't make it to the University of Manchester is because Manchester was not on an option for you when you were, in secondary school. Um, Oxford was not an option for you, but that doesn't make you inferior to that person. But even to make it even more interesting is amongst those guys that even went to Oxford, Cambridge, wherever it is, they still wanted to stand out. Was it enough to say I went to Oxford? There were maybe another 20 or 10 Oxford graduates in there. And in the midst of all these people, you find people who had already been to the Olympics, represented that country, roaring champions and all that. So how do you tell a story to stand out. So this guy told me that what he did was a few weeks into his, his um, time, he organized a party. He, I don't know where he got, he said he got the money from, I can't remember now. He raised money, bought drinks, organized the party, invited everybody, got them all drunk. He said because he just needed to stand out. So now I'm not saying you need to go to that extent, but you can think of something unique about you. You know, your background is already unique there's a high chance that you'll be one of maybe two or three of, I mean, four, four or five Africans in, in, the, in the group. What, is there anything interesting about you? Is, can you tell the story in a way that's memorable? You know, so this comes with practice and you, you need to prepare for this. You know, think yourself as Coca-Cola, right? When Coca-Cola develops a billboard, it's because they're trying to stand out from Pepsi. It is that important, you need to invest in it. This is why the first thing that comes to your mind when you get a job should not be how to get another certification or how to quickly spend a few months and get another job. It's how to establish yourself. And this comes through practice. I hope that's helpful. Okay, so moving on now. So this is how people remember you. 
if you are not, if they don't think you're an interesting person, there was a rule when I was working at Google that you hire people that you'd want to spend time with at the airport. So, you know, of course, things like that are good, but it also does mean sometimes that people end up hiring people like them. But one of the ways to break that cycle is also not to hide who you are and say things, present yourself in an interesting manner. Okay. Right, so that was preparing. You can see even preparation alone is a lot of work. Like even this pitch deck, I have the image, the mirror thing here because you even need to get yourself ready, pitch. What I typically do sometimes is I tell an interesting story about myself, right? Um, it could just be something really simple that will just make people laugh momentarily. Um, so, so, so at Google, the people, well in the UK, they call me Ola because, you know, after a while, part of the branding, when your name is Olato Komofaga and no one can pronounce it, people won't call you for interviews. So at some point, I truncated my name, applied, um, which function in JavaScript do you apply now to truncate? So we moved to the Kumo, did Ola, you know, and presented that. So there was a time I went to Spain and I went, I think, to Starbucks, I bought coffee and they asked me, so what's the name? I said, Ola. And they all started laughing. So because Ola in Spain, Spanish is hello. So they all just turned my name to a song and all that. And so it was, you know, so whenever I say to like, like a, a European audience, they all laugh. So that's how, that's a very simple way. It's not, oh, I've gone to the Olympics or whatever. It's just a very simple way of saying things. So just think about it. There's a way, think about things that will just make you stick, make you memorable, you know, very important. That's homework number one. Okay, let's go to observation. So when you then start on the job, you need to observe the people, right? This is why it's important. You can't just go there and focus on just coding. Observe the people, observe the culture, observe the politics. So there are a couple of models here. One is um, the culture web, that's the one in the middle. One is politics. So ask the question about politics uh, being bad, and I think 60, 7% or so said, yeah, it's bad to do politics. So we'll find out in a second if it's bad to do politics. But first let's talk about the people. Now, observing people has to do with listening. Some of us talk too much. You need to find the right balance. Um, so at the Design Institute, my good friend, Jair Kanu came up with this, you know, you listen with your eyes, your ears and your heart um, model, right? Eyes means you're really observing. You're looking beyond the surface. Ears actually means you're listening with both of them. So listening twice. And then heart means you're trying to tap into, you're trying to get the emotion out of them. This is really, really important. And this is why you can't go to work and spend all your time on your phone. You've got to look at people. And the thing I didn't add here is you have to also apply whatever traditional frameworks, whatever instinct do not despise those things those you know one of the things i like i like about the Igbo culture you know there's uh, if you watch all these um things fall apart or you've read things fall apart all these proverbs in there you can use those models those are unfortunately on documented frameworks that you can use to analyze situations and analyze people so don't throw them away so if you know any one of them please share them with me i am I regret not paying too much attention to my cultural studies when I was younger. But I have experience has taught me now that you know our forefathers spent a lot of time trying to understand themselves and they put those, they communicated those things through proverbs, sayings, and all that. Unfortunately, we despise some of them now, but they are actually very useful. The biggest mistake sometimes that we make is we stereotype people. So that's the first point. So you say, oh, someone is getting ahead because they went to Cambridge or Harvard or LSE. That's not usually the case. That is a, um, that, can, that could have, maybe they developed certain habits while they were there. But sometimes they don't necessarily get ahead because of that in itself. And sometimes they do because that gives them some access to some exclusive clubs. But really, it's not just because of that. So find out why they are doing it. What's the work ethic? Is it the way they talk? Is it the way they um, just interact with people. Is it the way, it, it, what is the other thing, the real tangible thing other than 
the school they went to or the private school they went to that's giving them the, the edge. You know, so really important. So don't make the assumption. So you work in a place that's full of one tribe and you say, oh, they're only getting ahead because they're a member of the tribe of the CEO. That's a very lame and lazy excuse. Find out exactly why people are making progress. Don't just use stereotypes or make assumptions. The other one is, you know, the hard stuff, empathizing with people. You know, if you understand what people really need and you can empathize with anyone, you can empathize with your boss, you can empathize with your colleagues. If you know what they really want and you deliver in line with what they want, you would have won a friend and an ally. And it's really important because sometimes many of our needs are not communicated, which is why businesses or companies that are able to tap into the unspoken emotion or the unspoken thoughts of people build products that people eventually love, right? Um, somebody once said that if you ask that Ford, the claim Ford said it, but some people said it's not true. If you ask humans, what kind of transport system do they want? They would have said they wanted a faster horse, but Ford eventually came up with a, with a vehicle, with a car, you know, and today no one uses, well, people still use the horse, but more for um, fun and adventure. The primary form of transportation has moved from the beast of burden to, to the vehicle, right? Part of the observation as well is understanding people and in your mind, or maybe when you go home, you map them. You know the people who are influencers in, in a company or in a business. So sometimes the people who influence decisions are not necessarily people with a big title. Um, back to one of the quiz points, which I think most people said uh, yes to. Sometimes it's the secretary to the boss. Um, because you want to see the boss, but the secretary decides the boss's calendar. So even if you're the boss's best friend, sometimes you can't get through to the boss if you don't make friends with, with, the, with the boss's secretary or the boss's PA, you know? And a very important one here is learning how to ask the right questions. There is no way I'm going to go through all the slides today. <laughs> but anyway, it's interesting. So learning how to ask the right questions. Learning how to ask the right questions has to do with asking open-ended questions. Do not make assumptions. Don't ask. So an open-ended question will have to do with where, why. We start with the where, why, what. How? See, very basic stuff. We all learn this in primary school. And sometimes we despise those things, but no, they are very important. How did you arrive at that answer? Open-ended, the person can tell you a million ways they did it. Don't say, did you arrive at that answer because you used the calculator? Then you box them into a yes or no um, scenario. So open-ended questions are questions that give people breath. And this is something you need in order to understand the culture of the organization. You need to ask questions. You need to pay attention. You need to observe. Don't just spend all the time, you know. The first thing you do is not to go and announce on LinkedIn that you just got a new, new job. To be honest, that's just stroking your ego. Nobody cares. You need to go in there and execute. Speaking to my bias, uh, you can tell that I'm not very popular on social media. Now, culture. So one of the best ways, now I think I will invite a few people to talk here. How do we, how do we communicate culture in our, in our different African tribes? Let's use the word tribes, African nations. There's a very wise man. There's a wise man here. I'll call on Ugo. Ugo. Ugo Chuku. Can you tell me how how we convey, how we teach person culture? Oh yeah, tradition. <laughs> Hi, Tux. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, so um, we we learn basically um, through oral means. Yeah. Um, I remember that telling me when, when I was younger that a lot of um, those wisdom and um, lessons were, were taught orally and um, were handed down from their forefathers down to their fathers, either through parables or through stories. That's how they were passed down. Unfortunately, we didn't do a lot of um, writing at the time anyways. Yeah. That's one of the ways they were passed down. Yeah. Th thanks, Hugo. And to be honest with you guys, it's the same thing in companies. 
you go into a company, they will tell stories. I'm sure if Nifemi has listened very well, she would have heard a few stories about the culture of the organization, about some of the projects they worked on that went well, some projects they worked on that didn't work well. And those stories will have heroes, somebody who came in and saved the day. We have villains, people who didn't do too well, and maybe they were fired. You can already tell a lot about an organization through the stories. Some of these stories become, they develop a life of their own as well, and they become myths. So, um, so I used to be the like CTO at Conga, and I remember I met someone many years later. The person never met me, never knew me, and I met her at the person at the party. And person, I, I think the person had just been laid off, unfortunately at the time. Conga ran into some challenges, and the person said, "Oh, talks. If you were Conga, I'm sure I wouldn't have been laid off." And I'm like, I don't even know who you are, <laughs> because somehow they just believed that you know. I guess because of the culture we had at the time, not necessarily because of anything that much that had to do with me. The culture we had at the time, Nigeria was so important. So I was there at the right time. And I think I just left before things went a little bit, there were some challenges. And if I had been in the business at the time, I would actually have been responsible for laying all those people off, but I wasn't there. And this person thought if I was there, uh, that wouldn't have happened, which unfortunately wasn't true. So stories do develop those. And sometimes organizations also make up stories so but listen for those stories that's how you learn about organizations don't these things are basic stuff but this puts it into perspective this model is actually like a master's level mba type model um i forgot i, I should put the uh, can I the names of the authors here um i've forgotten the name of their name off the top of my head now but i'll put it for reference next time uh, it's a very popular model i did it at, uh, during my mba as well um, why do people get rewarded? What do they get rewarded for? What are the rituals? So rituals, we're not talking about sacrifices here. We're talking about things like standups, appraisals, meetings, which ones are important. So, and how do the people conduct themselves as standups? So for example, if standups hold at nine o'clock or at 8.30, be, know that you have to be there on time. And you need to observe the way it's conducted and make sure you are lying. If you, at stand up, start sometimes cracking unnecessary jokes, it could completely put you off and make you look like you don't fit into the culture of the organization. That's why some people get fired for not being, for they'll say that they were not a good fit. It's simple things like this. Meanwhile, I apologize. I think someone is doing, I'm sorry about that. Meanwhile, they could have two master's degrees, but the two master's degrees won't keep them on the job just because they didn't observe the culture, they'll be deemed not fit for that company. So it's good to pay attention to these things, right? Um, okay, so next one we'll talk about uh, will be politics. So people said politics is bad. Um, I feel you and I shared, remember, just bear in mind I use the word shared. I shared your, really apologize. I can't do anything about the drilling. I'm in a flat and the person upstairs is drilling. Uh, share your, um, your thoughts as well around politics. But politics is not a bad thing. It's, it's a lie that we, we've been told. Everything at work, everyone at work is playing politics. But you need to learn how to navigate the workplace by identifying where people fit in. So there's a really good model. Again, this I need to acknowledge. It's called the um, fox, the donkey, the sheep, and the owl. If you Google it, you'll find it. there's a story around it. And these animals represent different characters you find at work. You find people who are always very sly. They are the people who will suck up to anybody, who will say anything to get ahead. They are the foxes. Um, at the bottom of this grid, you have the donkey and the sheep. Um, unfortunately, many of us, when we go into the workplace, especially techies, we find ourselves in one of these two, especially the innocent part, the sheep part. We claim we don't want to play politics. We just want to do our job. I just want to focus. I just want to do my job and move on. Unfortunately, if you do that, you may not make a lot of progress, even if you're really good at coding. So you need to move up to the wise column, the owl, where you're politically aware. You understand that people are political but you need to also act with integrity. 
speak the truth, give people the right feedback. Don't play unnecessary politics with people's careers, especially when you become a big boss and just help people to grow. I think it's really important. So if you Google this, and I can share the materials later on, uh, links to the internet, it's a really good story. It's a good model. Something you should be aware of. When you get into a, a new job, read it and observe. Very important. So part of the culture web talks about the organization structures. Again, that's the formal, that's what you see on paper, how the organization is structured. But the past structures may be different. Like I said, the secretary might be the influencer. Sometimes it's the guy who's been around a long time. They can tell you, this is how you do it here, this is how we do it here. You don't necessarily need to take everything they say, hook, line, and sinker, but just reflect on it. Um, okay, so let's see. I think I've finished observe. So guys, you know what? I think let, I've talked about two of the models. Let's have a discussion. Let's end this uh, on the hour and we'll have a second installment. Is that a good idea? I also don't want to go on and be insensitive and just, you know, take the whole evening. In some places, it's quite late. And I think it's good. I don't want to rush it either. So thoughts, questions. I'm thinking of taking a break here. What do you guys think? I think one hour is a good time. Can you even hear me? It's all gone quiet now. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, any questions or any thoughts? Let's take a break after two of the models. We have about yeah, um, 13 minutes, just have a conversation, observations, contributions, um, you know, even stories around what, how have you seen this at play before for those of you that are working, those of you that have started a new job, a new job and things like that. Um, so I, I have okay. a question, right? Yeah, go on, go on, go. Yeah, um, good evening again. Um, so um, you spoke of, um, first of all, trying to settle into a new job, taking yeah. time out to understand the lay of the land, which makes a whole lot of sense, right? Yeah. Um, but a whole lot of us work in startups, which yeah. um, a lot of times the, the environment is quite dynamic, right? Yeah. And so dynamic in the sense that even before you settle in, you're being shown the door due mm -hmm. to one reason or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what do you do in, in that regard? Because I, I guess that's why most people, once they get a job, they're already on the lookout for the next one because they feel that security is not there, especially in this part of the world. Um, what do you have to say about that? Okay, thanks, Hugo. I think that's a really interesting question. So I think that for, you know, when people when you start a job, it's for most people you would have most people will have two to three months right before they get shown the door i think if you come in prepared within a few weeks you should have established yourself especially if it's a startup so in a, in many ways startups are even like the environment where you can quickly show your yourself in a sense because startups they will hire and i agree with you sometimes they hire people with the sometimes with, with, with the thinking that you know if the person doesn't work we can dispose of this person but if you come in and i'm not saying that what i've shared now is foolproof but if you come in knowing that this is the structure of the industry. These are the leaders, this is what. You come in knowing your subject matter, come in knowing your technical knowledge. I think it's gonna take someone who is completely crazy or maybe on, unless the startup runs out of money or there's a complete change in direction. I don't see why anyone who's seen as a future leader, a contributor to that startup is gonna be let go. Does that answer your question, Ugo? Yes, it does. Thanks. So I, I, so I think it's about hitting the ground running. And this, what I'm sharing now is about coming in and just realizing that, look, you're you're stepping into a political landmine where you're going into, I don't want to be negative, right? But it's not political. And stepping in there, so you need to be prepared. Learn about the company, learn about the organization, learn about the company 
It's also about knowing whether or not to even take the job in the first place. You know, what do you know about the founder? Who, are, who has worked with them before? You know, what's, what's, the, what's the behavior? So that's part of the preparation to even know whether or not to take the job. And if you do then take the job, equipping yourself with as much information as possible that makes you relevant to the organization. Okay, so that's, thanks Hugo for that question. I have a question here. The person wants to be anonymous. They said, I started my internship a few weeks ago and then and they plan to return after six months. We have 14 interns that I have been feeling when the leader in charge of us mentioned that we are competing with one another. We are to close by 5 p.m. and I leave also a few minutes after five, after I notice I am always the first. I don't know if I'm damaging my reputation that way. Okay, I think this is a really, really practical question. It's an interesting question as well. So now my, my wife used to work for a law firm in Nigeria. And this is not even, has nothing to do with Nigeria as well. And I must say that I, I worked for some companies in the UK where I felt the same pressure. So let me use that as an example. So I worked in uh, with a company, I'm not gonna mention the name. And at, at the time I had young kids. So I could get to the office early, but I had to leave at five. Uh, because obviously I wanted to see, you know, money and career is important, but for me, family is also very important. I'm not, I'm not saying for those who it's for maybe for whatever reason, if not at the time, it doesn't matter much. I have my personal reasons. Um, and I knew that that was affecting my reputation. If I was being, if I, if I was being honest with myself, but then you, you, sometimes you have to make a choice, right? Um, and I don't, we don't always have the luxury of being able to choose. Do I want to chase promotion or do I want to have a family? So in my case, I decided, you know, I'll prioritize family. I'll do my job, yes. But in most companies, it's not the people that come early that they see. Oh, so let me say, don't let me say in most companies. In many companies, in some companies, it's not the people that come early they see, it's the people that leave late. So some people come late and they leave late. And some people will leave late not doing anything. So that is, and this person is asking, have they been political, politically unaware? So I think that in this environment, so I know in some consulting companies and law firms and all that, um, this is the culture. People tend to leave late. So if I'm being very honest with you, early in your career, if this is the culture, if you have accepted the job, I'll say, play along until you can find somewhere that's a bit more balanced. I'm not going to advise you that you'll be stubborn and going to start living at 4.55 when your guy is still, sorry for non-Nigerians, your guy is boss. Um, when your boss is still there, you know, sometimes, and it's not only in Nigeria, even in the Western world, in some investment banks, you can't leave early. If you leave early, there's a, there's a, there's a mark on your back, right? So I'll say that you, sometimes you also consciously have to be aware of the culture you're working, working into, all right? If it's a culture where people have to, you can't leave until the boss leaves, that's the culture. So you want to grow in that environment, you now make it, you need to make a conscious decision. Is this for me? Is this not for me? But be aware that that's the culture you're working in. Don't be naive and think you're going to change the culture. It's really difficult. Is that coming to your valid and telling all the elders? It doesn't make sense to prostrate. So I'm not gonna prostrate when I greet you. You know, some people will curse you. So I hope that answers your question to the anonymous asker. If that's the case, just send me a message and say yes. Otherwise, we can and we can still talk outside of this meeting. Okay. Anyone else um, with questions or contributions hello. or thoughts? Yeah, or hello. Questions? hello. Uh, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So this is my question uh, around observation, politics, and all. So my question is, the, um, you coming into a place where um, you don't um, have like a structure to say for growth. Yeah. Um, so how then in that situation do you personally upscale to become, say, I mean, um, you do, uh, let's say, um, a, I'm, I'm an intermediate software developer. You want to move to senior software developer role, right? But you don't, you work in a place that 
and don't have that structure of growth. You just do your job. Oh, they know you're good and things like that. So how do you now put yourself in that mood or shape of saying I've moved from an intermediate developer to a senior software developer? Yeah. Okay. So again, very good question. Thank you, Kola Ole. My thoughts around this um, senior middle uh, developer thing, I think some of it is objective. Obviously, some of it is obje objective as well. My advice to you is don't focus on the title, focus on the scale of problems you can solve. So now I've got a few people that have worked with me, you know, run a small consulting company. We didn't have a lot of money, so people were not paid a lot. And we didn't have money to, the moment you set up a structure and the structure is to the heavens, you have to have money to match, right? There were people that maybe were coppers, youth coppers, NYSC. So this is a mandatory program in Nigeria. They were seven, so there's like a one year, ideally when I was, when I finished school, it was like a one year internship. Some, many people didn't even do anything meaningful with it, but some people who were a bit more driven and fortunate did stuff with it. So there were people who were just completing this one year internship. And at the end of the period, they found another job somewhere and they, become, they, be, they were offered a senior software engineering job. And I remember there was a day I was talking to the family or someone else, I was just joking. I said, we have a people promoted this person to normal engineer. And this other company in general has offered them senior software engineering job. We couldn't do that because we didn't have the budget to do it. But we also offered a scale of problems to them to solve that it didn't really matter what we called them. They knew that they were senior software engineers because they were solving complex problems. So my advice to you is if you work, and if you work in a startup, most startups will not, from the get-go, invest in developing a uh, like a like an hr structure what is on the fire oh what's on the fire no, what is on the fire me? please go on mute <laughs> oh sorry, bear, sorry. No worries, yeah. bear in mind that whoever the founders of this company of your startup uh they've collected whatever one million five hundred thousand two three million five million dollars from investors the investors are after them for results so setting up a, like a, a proper hr structure might not be their immediate priorities. But what I'm also doing, and I guess I'll be talking about that in later stages, is you need, guys, you need to own your career. Don't, don't really leave it to um, HR to tell you when you're senior. Take on challenges. And if you take on challenges, you're solving problems for the organization, then at some point they will recognize that this person is solving problems for us, and then that also helps you become senior. So I think seniority comes from the scale of problems you can solve. So if there's a problem, put your hand up for it. If there's a challenge, put your hand up for it. Yes, you may not have the title, but that doesn't stop you from growing. Does that answer your question, Kalaoli? Yes, it does actually answer uh, my, uh, my question. Also, which would actually uh, lead me to um, actually uh, further on. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, like, in putting, uh, this is not really like, okay, let this uh, continue, but like putting oneself in that mood and, um, and role to say, oh, I can actually uh, you know, tackle this. Because that sometimes I've uh, noticed that people oh, follow your role, oh, you were, you were a junior, and then you want to apply for a senior role, and then you don't have that number of years, because I was actually a friend of mine that applied somewhere, and they needed somebody that was uh, that had five years experience. But fortunately, he had two years experience and he solved that particular problem that they wanted to push for. But they still did not um, accept him just because he didn't have that number of years. And I was shocked because yeah. I felt it was supposed to be um, a solution driven uh, yeah. situation. But that didn't have. So, how exactly do you manage such a situation? You can so, solve I wouldn't. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think that company is. I don't think. You know, I think if someone is fresh out of school and they can solve problems like seniors, like I said, many of the guys that I've worked with, you know, they ended up, yeah, almost all of them are senior software engineers in Berlin and none of them had, it was only the first two guys that had senior in front of their job titles uh, before they left. All the other guys, many of them just finished NYSE senior. 
it's any company that needs you to mark five years to claim you're senior, I don't think they know what they're doing. I think it's in the scale of the problems. Because even if you're senior, you know, if you're five years, doesn't mean you're senior because five years doing what? If you're five years and all you've been doing is um, updating a spreadsheet, does that make you senior? Right? So I think it's more about the problem. So if your friend didn't get that job, they shouldn't worry about it because that company is not serious about, um, yeah, about the right thing. So there's a question here. I think it's a final question I'll take because it's now um, 6 p.m. in Nigeria, 7 p.m. in Lusaka, and whatever. So how does one deal with being unmotivated in a work environment? For instance, you don't get feedback or support on new ideas. You don't see an opportunity for growth and you feel like you're just working to get a pay, but not impact. So let me take your questions one by one. How do you feel being unmotivated in the work environment? So, and I've, I've been in environments where I've been unmotivated before and there are a few reasons. One of the reasons you become unmotivated or demotivated is Sometimes peer pressure, everyone around is demotivated, they spread the bug and you need to bite into it. You know what? Own your own growth. Don't let the negative um, perception of other people affect you. Don't get into the group thing. Oh, everyone is complaining, I'm complaining as well. The question is, where are you going? You, you, you didn't come, you didn't arrive in that, you're, you're, you are there with other people, is it, you're all there, it, it's in a transient position. You're, you were all coming from different places. You're at that location, but you're also all going to different places. So that's the first thing. Don't let the mood, the like peer pressure affect you and then you become demotivated. Own your growth. Now, you don't get feedback. So that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about later on, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks when we meet. If you don't get feedback, you need to go seek feedback, right? Don't, and by the time there's a feedback structure, so many people are waiting for performance appraisals to know whether they've done well or not. By the time you're getting feedback at performance appraisal, it's too late. You should be actively seeking feedback from your, from the first task. You know, it's really important. I used to work for a very wise lady um, that she, and she, will, she will always say feedback is a gift and it's true. So don't wait to be given feedback. Actually, feedback is something you should own. And this comes to ownership, that if you own your growth, you own your career, you own your motivation, then you decide what you do with it. You, know, you don't allow other people to influence you. If your ideas are not being taken or being supported, then the question is how are you communicating it? You know, so try different ways. And it might also be because the environment isn't great, right? But learn how to do it. You won't always have buying. You won't always have people supporting you. So how do you navigate the environment? You know, um, yeah. You don't see any opportunity for growth. Like I said, own your own growth. Even though there's no hierarchy in that environment for whatever reason, it could be because, like I said, in my even in my own company, I know all these things. I know how to set up deep growth structures, but we just didn't have the budget to create one, right? So people worked, and I knew that at some point people were going to leave, and I. You know, when they leave, I don't fight them. Rather, like me, family, I welcome them back to come and contribute. So that's what we do. Um, so, but ultimately own your growth. Don't get disillusioned by the feeling into groupthink. Everyone is feeling unhappy. And I've been there before. It's not healthy. It to demotivate you. You end up put, putting out poor quality work. And unfortunately for you, if you're, if you're not careful, you could also get fired before the other people who have been disgruntled. Um, and you know, if you ever if you ever find yourself in a place where you, you just feel you're working without getting with, just for the pay, then you either have the wrong attitude or you're in the wrong environment. So I'll say first, change your attitude, fix yourself, and we'll get there as well towards the end. Because honestly, now that I always tell my wife that if I ever work for someone again, I'll be the best employee ever. Having run a business and hired people and have to make decisions and have to figure out to how to size are paid and all that, I see the difference. Now I empathize with the employer, not at the expense of the employee, obviously, but you know it's not that easy either. So I'll just say own your growth, um, develop yourself, contribute as much as you can to the organization. And when it's time, at some point, it's to be time for you to leave. You will, you know, no one is going to take that away from you. 
and also your contributions to the organization. Don't, as much as possible, don't burn your bridges, right? They'll, they'll see it for what you've done. Right, so it's five minutes past the hour. Let me, I think I've answered all questions. I, no, don't let me, don't let me, uh, let me stop sharing. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. We've had, I think we've had a good one hour. There are five model, models or five steps, parts of the model. I've covered two. So next time I'll try to cover the remaining three. And I, I'll work with Afalakem to reschedule the three. The recording will be made available. Um, most likely it's going to be put out on YouTube. So thank you to everyone who's joined. I'm happy that we had 49 minus me, uh, 58 participants. Thank you to all non Dufuna people that also joined. Please tell your friends about Dufuna. This was a free seminar that you can send us students. Um, what else do I want to know? Yeah, so that's it. So our, our mission is to help people grow, to help people develop their career. And that's what, that's what I'm doing here, helping people to, and also just reflecting and thinking, if I'd known these things, how would my life have been different? How would my career have turned out differently? Um, I don't think my career has been too bad, but it could even have been a lot more different, right? And that's why I'm sharing this. So I'm trying to document it, put it in frameworks, share with everyone so that you can go become rock stars. But when you make your millions, remember me. Over to you, I feel like I know. <laughs> <laughs> Please remember talks when you make your millions, everyone. Thank you so much, talks for the session. I believe everyone has learned something today, and I definitely we are going to have a sequel to this session because we just completed only two steps, and like Tok said, we have three more to go. So as soon as we have the next date for the next session, this will be shared with everyone on the Slack channel. So everyone have a great weekend, enjoy your weekend, and don't forget to continue learning anywhere you are. Bye everyone, thank you. Uh, Nifemi, thank you for being our guest contributor today. <laughs> thank you so much for <laughs> having me here. Yeah, really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye everyone. Bye, bye everyone.